Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be on site still in Boston, Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about what it's like to go through a process of getting into Ivy League schools. We're gonna be talking about a lot of high level conversation around finding meaning in life. I'm really excited to be sitting down with Whitney Nimit Patana. Hello. Hi everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks for inviting me. I greatly appreciate it. I'm really excited to talk to you. Mm -hmm. We have a lot to talk about. I'm really happy that Alex Chen introduced us. Yeah, Alex, Alex is the best. <laughs> I'm really glad I got the opportunity to meet you too. I feel really honored because um, I think if he thinks that I'm interesting enough to be interviewed, well, so be it. We had a lot of good conversation last night. We I, did. Yeah, yeah. I'm super pumped for this. There's a lot of good stuff to unpack about your life and about um, where we're going to go with this convo. Excited. Um, okay, let's talk about this because this, I don't think many people even realize what goes into the process of like working someone's ass off until they're like 17, 18, and then going and getting into a bunch of different Ivy League colleges. Mm -hmm. This is hard work hard work um okay so you were born in brooklyn right no so actually i guess Tell so um i guess just uh, how do where do i start the story um <laughs> so i guess um so i'm both my parents are ethnically Chinese, but my mom is from Burma, which is also known as Myanmar. Yep. And she grew up with, around the capital, whereas my dad is from Thailand, and he also grew up the, around the capital there. Um, both of them immigrated to the U.S. around the time they were teenagers or their early 30s, I mean 20s, I believe. And then, directly uh, to New York? Yep, directly in New York City, and that's where they met too. Okay. And then, um, so when I was, um, so when my mom was um, gave birth to me, um, we were living in Manhattan in that time, around the Chinatown area. Okay. And then when I was very young, around four year old, four, four years old, that's when we moved to Brooklyn. Okay. And then, okay, so this is already interesting because we, a lot of us have had these sort of parents that have come from other places and immigrated to the United States and and were raised children in the United States with a kind of like a cultural lineage from a different part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you're, you ended up now at four years old in Brooklyn and you, did you grow up with brothers and sisters too? Yep, I have one older sister. An older sister, mm -hmm. okay. And how many years older is she? Two years old. If Susie, if you're watching this, <laughs> hi. Shout out to Susie, <laughs> shout out Susie. Um, okay, so then you're growing up with her, you're four, she's six, and what is that like with your parents, with you figuring out who you are in the world? Tell us about that. Hmm. I think that at that age, um, you don't. I think you don't really know enough about the world, or at least like um, most people don't know about the enough about the world in order to in order to. Um, I think to really fathom like the sort of. Um, I think because especially given that now are very it's very tumultuous and also some very anxious times. I don't think we know we knew about all of that growing up. Um, I think I'm also I'm very lucky to have lived in a very diverse um, ethnically, socioeconomically, um, in terms of like religious background neighborhood. And that also that also affected me um, based on um, where I went to elementary school and middle school and high school. Okay, so it was socioeconomically, religiously, culturally diverse. Yes. In, uh -huh. Yeah, in Brooklyn growing up. Yep. I, it's very interesting because I'm um, growing up, I think um, that's something I took for granted when I was younger because I think a lot of people, especially when you live in more racially homogenous areas, you don't really, I think the one thing, the thing about New York City is that you literally have people from every single ethnic category in like perhaps in the same like square mile. And so you grow up, so I like, I grew up eating it um, um, you know, um, like Chinese food, Turkish food, Russian food, Jewish food, I mean like, you know, like kosher food, all like all that good stuff. Yeah. And then I think it's just that um, you you grow up you grow up like in this very it seems like the world is very tolerant like there's a, it's such a mixing pot and yeah. then you go to other places and then you realize that oh the, the world is actually more homogenous in certain places and some a certain pl it's not actually so um, I guess like you don't actually have like people who come with like lots of different certain like viewpoints in those places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, okay, so that right there is a huge point that you just brought up because I grew up in a vastly white 
uh, area of South Dakota, <laughs> and when you grow up there, it's it's odd when you see people that look different than a white person. Yeah, exactly. And that is weird because when you grow up in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. you get to see all of the different cultures. You get their fr you're they're they're not different. They're human. Yes, That's exactly. All, yes. I mean, and then also, I think the thing is, even if like people are like like so, Hollywood has a long way to go in terms of representation of minority people. I think the thing is that you also grew up will grow up with all these diverse, knowing all people of all different races and, and ethnicities, and exact like you said exactly that um, makes them very human. Um, so you, I think it's like. I mean, well, I guess like you could say that racial, like racial prejudices, still exist between like um like cultures. I think at the same time, I feel like it's um yeah, it's a very humbling experience, um, and I feel like um, it's a it's a, I guess like real is the word that I would use to describe it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad that we made sure to touch on the humanization side of things as we melting pot our cultures together. Mm -hmm. It becomes a whole a, a planet full of humans, and that's um, moving forward how we can prosper most effectively is when we treat each other that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so growing up in the melting pot and then slowly but surely figuring out what you wanted to do a little bit in mm -hmm. your high school. So tell us about like, figuring sure. that out. Sure. Um, I think I didn't like so I think everyone's very familiar with um, the tiger parent archetype but I think it would I mean like actually kind of um, unique in the sense that my parents like we I never I was never really pushed to become like oh you have to become an engineer or a doctor well of course there's um I was always taught that okay to have ambitions and to want to achieve more but at the same time I think they were also chill in certain aspects as long as I got good grades and I got into a good school then that's all and then I got I you know I chose a lucrative career path and that's all that mattered yeah this, mm -hmm. even even that sort of parenting of like you know we worked so hard to to bring you into the world and make sure you do something that's lucrative mm -hmm. and uh, there's there's a sort of a the, the, it's important the most important thing is for that the child just has their fullest potential brought into the world I, exactly yeah it, it's funny because i think um so there's this facebook group called subtle asian memes that's exploded in popularity in the past month um and i think there's one meme that really see, see, stands out to me because um a lot of um a, like especially um first like first generation asian parents they come here they teach their children they enroll their children in music lessons for the piano and violin and only usually only those two instruments because there's some sort of um i think clout with those instruments with those specific instruments so no like guitar or anything wacky and then and then so and then you and they like they um they encourage their children to continue with music lessons and to achieve um and to continue playing those instruments but then when let's say if like you're if, but then when their children like they let's say like um you would uh, you would think that the logical path is to become um like to c pursue a career in music after all that musical training but uh, that's obviously um forbidden <laughs> that's like sort of forbidden Bidden because of that because it's a creative um, career so I think it's just like that sort of di um, that like dichotomy is like something that I just like said that yeah it's something that's very ironic <laughs> <laughs> and I want because I think I feel like down the line we're gonna end up figuring out a more effective way to uh, open up uh, both an equality of opportunity for young kids to mm -hmm. figure out what they're passionate about and do it and also for parents the figure out, you know, motivate the kids, mm -hmm. but also give them, you know, congratulate them when they do well mm -hmm. along the way and don't maybe thwart off some sort of part of their creativity because it may not be lucrative. Mm -hmm. Because we're gonna potentially start, the market's potentially gonna start correcting and going towards creativity a little bit more. It already is uh, in some regards. I, I think that's accurate to say. Um, for one thing, I'm, I strongly believe that um, change begins um, on the, at the generational level. So um, us, um, f like, one, like, you know, first and second generation kids who were brought up in the US and other countries um, as part of this um, Asian diaspora, I think um, we recognize that um, our parents did the best they could grow, like when they were raising us and while um, their methods may not have been the best, um, I think it's on us to, con to make sure that um, our offspring, um, that we like 
that we push them in the right directions so that they can achieve their full potential um, regardless. Um, we don't have to focus on just STEM or careers that we consider lucrative or prestigious. Um, we want them to achieve um, like to the best of their ability. And, I, and to your point, I think in terms of rewarding creativity, I think especially, I think, it's a, I, I think this just popped in my head, but I think um, especially as jobs get more, more and more jobs get automated, um, just um, building creativity and other soft skills especially just some you know yeah. being able I think those will become more and more important as we as like um, a lot of jo our op the current jobs get automated but the new jobs will I think new jobs will arise based on that um, you know after based on how society is changing yeah I'm glad that you're really honing in on uh, creativity and social emotional skills being uh, super important as automation arises uh, they're gonna it's a, it's gonna be a very interesting transition that occurs in the next couple of decades and for us we are around 25 ish versus for kids that are born today when in 2045 things are gonna be incredibly uh, challengingly uh, different to what is it gonna be like to be creative in 25 years and what is it gonna be like to go through the high school process so as 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 okay so as <laughs> i know we can go off so many ways winnie and i can talk about a bunch of different things together um and l let's let's come let's come to this because you you know you mentioned this already once and i want to see if we can maybe even identify some of the uh the culture the cultural transgenerational sort of pr the pressures that occur that kind of that make it so that parents act in a certain way with their kids that mm -hmm. potentially maybe uh, drives them in a certain direction rather than uh, enables them to freely explore and figure out who they are. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I guess like, where should we start then? Okay, well you brought up, well, you, you brought up tiger parenting and you kind of gave that, you gave, a, you gave it a good example. Um, Cause, okay, let's start, let's start maybe with this. Um, we've seen oh, time and time again more and more data showing that the more that you are born into low SES, the different your life outcome is from someone mm -hmm. that's born into a high socioeconomic status. That similar sort of concept can be applied to your parent, your parenting. Mm -hmm. If the parenting skills are high openness, high explorativity, mm -hmm. versus if it's a nope, you got to follow this path and this is what only things that we're giving you. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, I can imagine that being the case because parents who are higher openness and more open to other methods, I think um, they're more able to adapt their um, pa their parenting to different sort of p sorts of personalities and thus provide a fostering environment for their children. And of course, um, I think like yeah, having of course having b b more means to also means that you can um, prepare your child for this rat race um, sooner. Mm -hmm. It's I think I, it's very interesting because I read an article recently on BuzzFeed. Um, they have pretty good long form pieces, uh, besides just besides their listicles about millennials being the burnout generation. I think and one of the tenets of that piece was that um, we were everyone is so or at least people our age are so so burnt out all the time is because um, we were raised to optimize all aspects of our life from not and not just our, our like our career and academics but even our leisure so it's like oh um, things that we're that we would do in our off time like exercise or eating or even cleaning are things that have to be um, optimized as well give me a little more on the mm -hmm. optimization of what what is that like tell me about that hmm I guess maybe one example is that like um, I feel like nowadays especially like um, with the um, proliferation of the and of social media and how that gives you like sort of like a panopticon into what everyone is doing um, I think you're like there's a lot of um, more more like uh, moralism regarding um, how people eat so for example like the shift towards some um, organic and vegan foods mm. I think I, I can't help but notice that there's also some a little a tinge of um, like moralism there and which it's which sort of says like oh the quote-unquote cleaner you eat the better of a person you are I mean oh. at the end of the day it's like you, you know eating is just eating it's like for fun and I think for and especially for people who grew up in immigrant immigrant families um, it's also part of your culture and your childhood as well and who is to determine what clean is or what good is 
well, okay, sure, clean energy. Okay, we can probably determine yep, mm -hmm. that that's solar, wind. Yep, wind, exactly. Yeah, things that diffusion. don't um, that things that don't contribute to environmental pollutants. But with regards to clean, quote unquote clean eating, yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> who gets to decide? It's like trying to decide who gets to decide what hate speech is, and that's been a pressing issue that um, is permeating through culture right now. Is people throttling uh, a the pay of artists and comedians and other performers because they're deciding mm -hmm. on whether or not that performer is using hate speech or not. Who gets to decide? How does civilization figure out what, of course there's a big difference between things like the KKK mm -hmm. and between someone that's trying to make a, a statement about, about potentially race or gender mm -hmm. or um, obesity or whatever it may be. Um, and now all of a sudden they can't potentially do that? What's mm -hmm. up with the, the clean food too? You can't, you tout around a veganism attitude mm -hmm. or a carnivorism attitude, and you may potentially be stuck in a single mode of thought that's mm -hmm. not open to, again, experience looping back to what we were talking about with mm. parents as well. Hmm. You, make a, you make a very interesting connection there. As, in terms of freedom of speech, I think, um, I think it's very, especially like where we live in an age where we're saturated with information and we have unprecedented access to information through our Facebook news feed, through our Twitter feeds, through everything. Um, so not only do we get the nitty gritty details on what people are, 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 you know, our social circles are doing or rather what they want us to see that they're doing, um, I think we'll probably like touch on this topic later. Yeah. Um, but we, I think, like, so once um, someone releases, so let's say an artist releases a song, then that and that, I think, like, pe because of how ubiquitous um, social media is, people um, are free, and especially since you, you have the freedom to, you technically have the freedom to say anything you want on the internet, so people feel like people are going to say what they want to say. And then I think it's just that, before, like, perhaps, like, in a different age, we didn't, people, we didn't have um, access to um, that, like, you know, mediums that could proliferate information so quickly and so efficiently. But now, I think, especially as societal attitudes change too, um, especially in re regards to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, in term, in, yeah. um, so I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I guess, like, yeah, it just, it's hard being a celebrity. I, I would just say it's hard being a celebrity these days because no matter what you say, some always, there's always going to be someone who's like, um, I think, who will have something to say about it, whether it's a think piece or whether it's like, I don't know, some um, random YouTube comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was even a. A uh, recent way of viewing things from a, a multi-decade long process, which I thought was interesting, people that have been around for uh, almost like a half century, that they have said things that back in the day it was completely different trying to get press. Now mm -hmm. you can just make a Twitter post and it's called press. Exactly. And so it's just a democratization of the sem dissemination of information, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more um, that that's doing <clears throat> across the world. Um, Okay, so let's jump back to um, the high school days. So, yep. so f how did you end up figuring out that you wanted uh, uh, to go you know, I, like Ivy League style? And what's that like? What's what's that whole process like of who you were in high school? Now, so the thing, like, so now that I think about it in retrospect, um, I think the only reason I, I strive for those schools is because like, oh, it's always good to strive for the best. And I think, but now that I re now that I think more about it, I'm really really grateful for having had the opportunity to attend those institutions. Yeah. Especially in terms, I think when, especially when um, bringing up the, to return to the conversation about SES, like socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. There's some, um, I think, as for when it comes, I think education is one of those things that um, can really catapult, catapult people who are like, you know, from a certain SES into a higher level SES within one generation. Yeah, that's a huge point. It's almost as though if you work really hard for one generation, you can start surrounding yourself with a couple potentially income brackets mm -hmm. higher exactly. than your previous generation, I and mean, then mm -hmm. build on that. I mean, yeah. but then again, it's like it's not not to say that it's easy though or anything because totally. and, and of course, I mean, I think so. And not to say that it's all only about SES. Either. Yeah, but it's yeah. not only about us. I think yeah. yeah, there's so many factors that um, go into college admissions. Honestly, I think I feel lucky that like okay, I. Um, I, you know, I got in when I got in because I can only, to be honest, I can only see it getting more competitive unless yeah. there's some great revolution. Then um, yeah. I think it's only going to get more and more cutthroat. It's already damn cutthroat. Exactly. You were like, you were like a great 
amazing GPA, amazing test scores, amazing extracurriculars, amazing essay writing, and you got into Ivy Leagues. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, then there's the limitation in spots that's going on. Mm -hmm. There's people from around the world that are applying, not exactly. just... Yeah. yeah, and I think it's, it's just crazy because um, it didn't occur to me until I actually set foot on campus, but they're actually, it's just like, it's crazy because some people have been like groomed for their entire lives for success. For, and then I think especially when you go to like certain private schools too, the way that their um, curriculum and like um, their requirements are set up or, or is that, that it, it actually, it makes you be successful in the college application process is because you have to do ex extracurricular, you have have to take certain classes um so it and it and then of course then it's like you're if you go to like certain pri certain private school then like uh, your parent it's very likely that your parents have likely have access to more resources too yeah. um but yeah, I think when I was in high school, to be honest, I hadn't really thought about it and all this college stuff until like my sophomore or junior year. Yeah. So I think I also perhaps I got like maybe perhaps I got lucky a little too. <laughs> it's so important to identify that we get lucky. A lot of we see a lot of people run around with a mentality of like I earned everything myself. Blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. But it's so important to say that we stand on the shoulders of giants that already made. Uh, ubiquity in food and electricity and mm -hmm. water and so many of the things that we get to build on top of and even then we got lucky a bunch in our lives you know I did you did and mm -hmm. so many people do and so it's important to be humble about about that yeah okay so mm -hmm. give us uh give us the now so it ended up being Harvard it yep. ended up being where you ended up going uh -huh. and that was a uh, class of 2016 yep yeah so there was from 2012 2016 at Harvard this is actually an interesting point I mentioned mm -hmm. this to you um and I th and I think this is an interesting thing that people keep talking about is that you you're like you're such an exceptional figure at your high school mm -hmm. and then you go to your Ivy League college and then you're surrounded by other exceptional figures and then it's like whoa because then you you it's just a total change in perspective I mean to be honest I feel like every single person at Harvard experiences that to some extent especially I think especially the more unprepared you come to like at least for me, when I was in high school, I could put the minimal amount of effort into, you know, like studying and still get like, let's say, perfect scores on tests. Where, but it, whereas in college, okay, you're out in the big open world for the first time with no parental supervision. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, not and not only that, in, in in most like public schools, like you know, it's like the, your day is already laid out for you. You have to go to this class, and then you have to go to this class, and you have to go to this class. Where but in college, um, your schedule is a lot more flexible, and also and it's not like they're going to, and the professors don't hold your hand in terms of the curriculum. You have to come prepared to class in order to learn well, and you also have to be proactive in your learning too. So there's not so there's already that like um, you know factor, but then there's also there was also I feel like there was also a culture shock for me but because I think I guess like so I came from a high school where um, a really big public high school where like I mentioned before um, it was really diverse not only in terms of race and ethnicity but also just like socioeconomic status and I feel like and places at Har like Harvard and other um, elite institutes institutions you don't necessarily have that diversity what you could say that like I mean that you don't um yeah you could say like you could say that in terms of racial diversity in terms of socioeconomic status but I think there's one but one really incredible thing about these institutions though is that I feel like you get um people who like with um lots of different life experiences and viewpoints even it's it's as though you take the the best of a bunch of different local areas and uh, across the world and you bring them to one point mm -hmm. and this is very that's kind of exciting it reminds me a little bit about kind of like what it's like to be at like Google campus oh yeah totally yeah uh-huh yeah I um, and and to be there or to be at Harvard right to be at these sort of like epicenters of an of an intellectual uh, group that is already worked quite hard to achieve something in their mm -hmm. lives already that's exciting and then trying to learn from a bunch of the different ones about what their mm -hmm. world perspectives are what they're doing 
you decided on physics, mm -hmm. which is exciting. Yep. And, and so, like, what was that like to figure out that it ended up being physics? Well, I guess, like, going into Harvard, I already knew I wanted to study physics. I think probably because I had some good te physics teachers in high school. And also, I think I just felt like, okay, um, it's, 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 fun, it's interesting. It's also very... Um, it's also very good to be honest like not going to lie it's also very um you know it's like something that you can put on your resume and then people and then you're and, and like it looks good on your resume too <laughs> <laughs> yep mm -hmm. okay and then now what is the like for you give us like, kind of like a snapshot of what some of like the most profound takeaways were for you in that four-year period hmm well Oh man, I'm I'm, just, I'm trying to like think of all the academic material now, and I'm like, uh. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I haven't done physics in a long time. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, yeah. And I, hmm, just like off the top of my head, though, I I guess like, hmm, in terms of like profound takeaways, I guess like one, I guess like well, I guess like we are for one thing, I like. Take, always take always like look around you and take advantage of all the opportunities that are around you and so okay so in, I guess like to give a concrete example I really I sort of regret how I didn't take advantage of all the wonderful opportunities at Harvard so for like for example um, getting funding to do certain things like um, let's say funding for study abroad programs going to places that you would have like never dreamed of or getting funding to do um, certain projects or to pursue like um, certain things I think like especially um, one like yeah, I guess like one interesting thing about Harvard is that like oh when you like when your club wants to invite a speaker to campus, it just say just say like oh we're from Harvard and then that probably pikes their attention. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you brought up you know carpe diem you know seizing the day, seizing these opportunities that come, the doors that are presented to you, open walk through them, go through those doors exactly, uh -huh. and that's a way to maximize your potential in mm -hmm. the world. You end up figuring out that you could have learned potentially so many, so much different information when you went and maybe studied abroad, or when you actually reached out to those couple speakers to have them mentor you, to have them speak at your organization, or go and take the risk of getting involved with different mm -hmm. projects. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Oh man, I'm just thinking about all the things I could have done, <laughs> but I guess it's never too late. Um, even when you leave college. Yeah, I think. Yeah, no, sorry. It's okay. Uh -huh. the, the Whitney in uh -huh. all the other uh, concurrently running parallel universes are exploring the things that you didn't get a chance to do <laughs> in this one. <laughs> I, I don't. Know, I hope. Um, I hope. Um, I hope those Whitneys converge into this timeline soon. <laughs> they do. They all. They, yeah, you give, it's happened to all of them at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Now, okay, so now 2016 comes around and you're figuring out, um, this is actually interesting because you ended up doing a lot of work in data. Yep. And I actually thought this was really cool because uh, there seems to be a growing movement for outcome-oriented uh, data in healthcare. Exactly. Uh huh. Tell, teach us about this. Sure. Well, actually, um, I'm not too, to be honest, I'm not too familiar with um, healthcare, like the nitty gritty of healthcare data science, that sort of stuff. But um, recently, I worked for um, the Accountable Care Organization, um, like um, part of the Massachusetts Medicaid program. Um, so Mass Health provides, um, you know, like um, health, like health insurance for like let's say millions of members in, in the Massachusetts state. And I had the opportunity to work within their payment reform division um, on this ACO program. So I actually, well, I didn't work on the policy or the operational side. I worked on data management. It was a really um, educational experience for me overall. Yeah, we're transitioning to outcomes on the healthcare side of things. Um, and that's so important to make sure that people are actually healthy and that mm -hmm. when they come into our institutions that they leave healthier. Um, this is, there's a lot of weird corruption that's 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 occurring that we need to actually take a um, a, a second, third, fourth glance at and uh, and solve. So okay, so what has what's go, what's going on with okay? We're like you know we're like 25, 26, mm -hmm. and we're you know mid twenties, and there's so many people that are graduating college that are like you know they're they're in many ways they're struggling to find meaning in their mm -hmm. lives, and. 
it's hard because we even go through these ups and downs. Like one day you're roaring with meaning and the next day you're like, oh, it's so meaningless. What's going on? So what, how does one find a sustained sense of meaning? Well, so for one thing, I am one of those 20 something year olds and I'm also struggling to find meaning in like my own life. So perhaps this is the blind leading the blind. But um, I, I think from what I figured out so far, though, I think um, I would, I guess, uh, my, like, I first, I, I, at first I think, okay, I started chasing just hedonistic, materialistic things, but, and there's nothing wrong in chasing those things too, but uh, more often than not, um, chasing those things, um, I think they only provide um, ephemeral, ter temporary relief, yeah. but I think, and I guess like what make, I guess like when some the first thing that comes to mind in terms of what gives me meaning to my life is um, having genuine valuable connections with people. And when I say valuable, I don't just mean that in a materialistic or a transactional way. Um, I think like one uh, one thing that you le especially learn when going to elite institutions like Harvard is that um, I think a lot of people there tend to see relationships in a transactional way. Like who can you refer me to? Who do you know? Can you get me into to this like sorority or club can you like get me a referral for this job and I don't blame them because I think it's just it's just a really cutthroat environment um it really fosters that attitude but it doesn't necessarily have to be like that all the time and um I guess having transactional relationships itself isn't a bad thing especially if like if they're mutually beneficial then that's good but then I don't think it's bad to want to have um genuine relationships either with genuine human connection well, I like where you took us there. Okay, so there's this sort of, there's a spirit that one can move themselves with through the world that is a loving, kind essence mm -hmm. to everyone, to all humans, Yep. period. Mm -hmm. And then further than that, it's like, okay, well, what brings you meaning? Okay, well, maybe it's for me, it's mm -hmm. building this project. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I'm going to look for people that I think are interesting to sit down and talk to. Mm -hmm. And so then that's the idea of finding, like, utility. And I was, I'm, I'm, I'm really just I'm, I'm hesitant to even like start just trying to intellectualize what being transactional or materialistic or right all these different things are it's if you, if you carry yourself with that unconditional love period mm -hmm. it's almost as though things kind of just come they come to you you give you come and give things r arise and go yeah yeah that's that's a really interesting point it's something I've actually been thinking about recently too I think a lot a lot of things I think one thing that a lot of people my age especially like when you can't like, especially people who um who have um who have let's say who, um i guess like grew up with like asian immigrant parents is that i think you all you it's like you struggle to think about oh what value am i giving to people i think um a lot what a theme that i've noticed among like um like cho like second generation Im a um, asian children like in who, those whose parents were immigrants is often it's that oh like no matter how well you do it seems like it's never enough you're always going to be compared to like cousin so and so who plays the piano or or even if like you could be a world class like violinist and you got, you have three Ivy League degrees and you're an astronaut and a doctor and whatnot, but then still like oh why aren't you married yet? Where's my grandkids? <laughs> Damn, that's legitimately a, a, a parenting conversation that occurs, yeah. Oh yeah, and it's not, of course, it's not just something limited to Asian immigrant parents. I feel like it's something that like, um, that like is probably like um, um, something that uh, like, you know, people, a lot of people our generation feel like the idea of um, just comparing your, like just being compared to other people and the idea that, oh, it's like, am I ever good enough? Mm. Whew, gosh, that one sits, ooh. It's, um, you know, Mr. Rogers did a really good job at, at telling people that they are good enough and that they are loved as they mm -hmm. are and that there is a, it's such a, it's a soothing and calming feeling to know that one is loved and that, um, that one is love and that they do provide that love to, to others um, as well. Yeah, it's hard. 
it's, yeah, it's, it's like hard. It, it, it's it's hard to embrace that feeling because I just think, or at least like so to go back to your point about like if you live your life sincerely with loving kindness, then you don't have to be transactional. Then things that loving kindness and like and I guess like yeah. and the material ways in which that manifests will come to you yeah. naturally and organically. It's something that I think okay, I should know this um on a I should know this already. I should live my life that way. But I guess if I feel resistant to live it that way because I'm afraid. Afraid. I'm afraid that like oh what if like I, I like I live my life that way but then I'm taking it taken advantage of or like I'm left with nothing mm. there's a there's a, a, a feeling of slight vigilance with love that it's because there will be a a, a, a slow fading of of the malevolent instances that you speak of it'll fade mm -hmm. away over time but it, to remain a little bit vigilant as you go mm -hmm. is uh, important so you carry the wake of positivity and love and mm -hmm. then um, stay slightly vigilant as you go through to make sure that you can continue bringing forth yourself fully right yeah. like so set so setting healthy boundaries for yourself Mm -hmm. So that you, um, I guess, like one way you could put it is that um, set he healthy boundaries for yourself, and um, you'll be able to um, love yourself as well, and that helps you, um, I guess, like give to other people. Yeah, if you take a uh, <clears throat> a practice in like future authoring, goal setting, mm -hmm. conscientiousness, just see if maybe if I choose to pursue a non hedonistic thing for a week or a month that I take something off of the list and I just add something else, maybe creative to the mm -hmm. list, something else that could unlock a new way of thinking for me. Mm -hmm. And I do that for a week or a month. What would happen? And then you just do you know, self, quantified self, you just analyze yourself afterward or how you feel after mm -hmm. that week or month. These are the sort of th ways that you can actually figure out who you are better. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I think like I, mean, I, I couldn't help but think about an earlier part of our conversation um, where we where I mentioned how um, us millennials were so burned out all the time is because um, we feel like we have to optimize every part of our life. And then I guess another an, uh, in, 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 as a as a result, we were expected to be productive all the time. Mm. So we feel bad if we're not being productive and hence um, even mundane tasks like, I don't know, filing your taxes or take or like, mm. um, you know, sending a form that are supposed to be, um, you know, they're supposed they're technically they're supposed to be easy. Well, I guess filing your taxes isn't, uh, isn't a good example. But yeah, sending like, let's say sending a voter registration form or um, giving a call to like your primary care provider mm -hmm. or like going to the pharmacy to pick up your prescription those things are technically mundane technically very easy mm -hmm. but you feel resistance to doing those as well that's such an interesting point because that happens all the time with the mundane sort of I have to go drop off a physical letter at the post office <laughs> <laughs> and it's like uh, uh, what can I do with that half hour of my life? I could do something else. Um, there's so many things like that, that even the optimization for food is just like, I'm going to drink Soylent instead of having to go and, and <laughs> Like, and what leave. is food anymore? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, am, yeah. I, I, I hope I don't want to be in a room with people who've only eaten Soylent. Like I imagine years. that was just things to your digestive system. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange to test what it is like to consume that for years or some um that this is this is a important subject that we're talking about i this there's um there's such a rage for productivity and that is all affecting mental health and it's the, 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 where's the meditative spirit yeah i think I think especially, uh, of course, I, it sounds like it sounds like I'm like raging against social media all the time. But I think I don't have anything against social media. I love it. I scroll, I scroll, I, I, you know, I scroll on Facebook all the time. <laughs> but I think, um, and I think like in like the idea that that we are supposed to be productive all the time also ties into the idea that um, we have to project the best image of ourselves all the time too. So when I say that we're supposed to optimize even our leisure activities, I think. 
that like I I mean I mean that by saying oh like we have to project the best image of ourselves on our social media we we have to cultivate even like our leisure activities to seem like we're doing the best things all the time or at least like show the best parts of ourselves yeah ain't nobody taking a an insta story on the way to the post office i'm going to drop off a letter right now exactly yeah, no one's <laughs> <laughs> it's always that this super profound moment of my life that i'm capturing and sharing with other people where i look the best and and yeah one of my one of my friends um, shout out to Casey and and also and my and myself occasionally will purposely take photos that are mm -hmm. not the most uh, good looking <laughs> of ourselves and post those because that it changes the culture and it's those little things that if you if you upload the more potentially the more mundane or not as as pinnacle appearing ones that that could actually potentially let other people be like yeah it's fine to not wear makeup or mm -hmm. it's fine to for me to to do a little bit of like this and some or whatever you know <laughs> yeah. yeah i think i really respect them or like i really respect people who are able to post about their vulnerable vulnerable moments on facebook too like um i think yeah that's something i really respect well i don't have like i don't think there's any i don't think there's anything like inherently bad in wanting to share like those wonderful shining moments like oh i just ate something really delicious or oh here's a, like a thirst trap picture of me um <laughs> but um i really do have um i think it's like i yeah i really um i really value people who are able to share like more um they're more in, like uh, how do i not not necessarily intimate but just more um, meaningful or like not in like moments on facebook where like okay it's like okay it's like okay i admit i'm not feeling the best right now or okay like yeah. something's bad happened to me um so and then i think like people who can ask like for help too i think is also like yeah i think that's like a very valuable like utility mm -hmm. of these platforms that gets underused asking for help and sharing vulnerable stories i totally agree that th that's a, such an underutilized part of being able to talk to others on social platforms okay i want to uh -huh. do some uh, power round thoughts okay what do you think is Tr is tr sort of transcendent of the human experience. Some people call it God or all that is or whatever exists past the three-dimensional reality. Uh -huh. You know, what do you think the simulation, what do you think about, about that? Transcendent of the human experience. Could you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah, some people think that there's, there's some sort of a, 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 an ethereal power within the cosmos, mm -hmm. you know, or that, there, that it is a simulator, or that it is a god, or that mm -hmm. it is, and you are a character, and in the, in the, what do you think about things like that? Hmm. Well, without, um, without getting into metaphysical things or spiritual things, I guess, like, one thing that does transcend the human experience is narratives and stories and this and the tropes that make up those stories um it's something this is something i've been thinking about for a while but i think a lot i think or at least like i'm the type of person who likes to daydream a lot and come up with stories in my head scenarios of people and especially like oh sometimes like i think about oh what if what, what would happen if like something else happened or i'm daydreaming about um oh what if like i got into this like or what if this scenario happened with like you know with like with the people in my life as the characters or like the npcs if this was a, were a video game um I think that even if the tropes that appear in stories may not always hold true in real life, I think there's something that's very tell like powerful about them that causes us to perpetuate those tropes even if they don't always um, fulfill reality. Mm -hmm. um, what about, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh, that's another really good question. Hmm, but I guess... And one, I think uh, I have a, or I have a couple of things in mind. Can, do I have to say just one, or can Don't I say give multiple? Us the couple. I guess, I guess, like for, I guess, like, hmm, I guess one thing is just. I guess like how like especially I guess like coming from the experience of someone who studied physics, just like how certain. Um, laws of nature just seem to work out so well um i think that just without going into too much detail i just think that's something that's like very beautiful and profound um another thing is um just 
having genuine human connection and just realizing that you're loved by so many people i know that sounds like really cheesy but i think especially when you're like um in a very dark mo like during very dark moments or you when you're feeling really low you really underestimate the um the impact and the effect that you have on other people so while okay maybe true you are just like one in seven billion people on this world or you and you might not be the most influential um there are still people who care about you and people who would um, notice if you stopped existing mm -hmm. but then the question becomes how long do they how long do they notice yeah, they yeah i think but well that's i guess that, that's a good and question you're gone. well 100 billion people that lived and died before us today how many can you name 20 a oh. <laughs> hundred maybe i don't know a thousand if you give me some time yeah <laughs> out of the hundred billion there yeah. you go but i guess like I mean, and I don't think in my lifetime that I can achieve immortality and I don't I wouldn't want to be immortal either because I think I would just get annoyed at this after a certain point, just like seeing the same people. I don't or I guess on, on if everyone else achieves immortality, too, then I just see the same people over and over again. And it might get annoying. And if other people don't achieve immortality, like in a tuck everlasting like sort of scenario, um, then that would actually be sad. Just <laughs> but, jump into different designed virtual worlds and then you can go explore whatever you want yeah different people i mean i guess like after a couple thousand years um i guess like don't you get bored um uh, yeah i guess but that's another question sorry um where was i going anyway? oh that's that's funny so after several <laughs> thousand years would you end up getting bored of all of the different things that you can actually do yep okay um when is there something else that you think we should cover on the way hmm. um, well, we had a really interesting conversation about simulacra on on our ride here. That's a good and point. if I guess like if there's one takeaway that I want to give to this audience um, tonight, it's that social media, like social media and the projections of ourselves that we um, put on social media has led us to um, living, um, living in this, living out these simulacra of um, what we think that our lives should be like, as opposed to what our lives actually like. So that this is so the this can like this can be um, described in many ways so um you think that people are living always living the best versions of their lives for example this like i don't know maybe like you see a couple on facebook or instagram and they always look always so um, well put together and that their relationship is so harmonious when behind the scenes you don't know about like um all their art their arguments or maybe it's just like you don't know that they took a couple a hundred different pictures and they chose the best one to put online um especially so, so this is something that's especially true for um, woman I think um you don't like it's like you see like all these perfectly curated pictures and a lot of them are usually like oh you don't know like okay maybe this it's just like good lighting and makeup and even like digital retouching that's like really co I think like, uh, yeah that's especially like getting more and more common with like snapchat filters I think and um I did, like I feel like it's also like much more prevalent in the east than it is in the west too excuse me so um you feel like you're obligated to look a certain way when in reality and you feel obligated that um you you should be living a certain t life but like this col this is just a collective illusion um it's not like it's not the reality it's not the reality what's real is actually just like these mundane boring sometimes ugly parts of our lives along along with the good parts of the lives and uh, interestingly enough, a simulacrum could potentially be a, a, any sort of a representation of you. You could pick whatever, but it's that we pick the 1% that is the absolute cream of the crop. Exactly. We could pick the most mundane. We could pick mm -hmm. the most entertaining. We could pick the most humorous or the most artistic. We could pick any of those or a combination of them. That's a good point. Yep. I like that takeaway. Mm -hmm. Winnie, uh -huh. this has been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thanks so much for talking to us. It's been a pleasure. Um, there's a lot to, to take away from what it's like to actually go through the process of, of being someone like you. This is good to talk to you. Yeah, um, I'm like really honored to appear on the show. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear some of your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know. Also, do uh, build, go create, manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Much love. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. And live sincerely. Bye, everyone. Bye.